G'day, my name's Ian Stevenson. I'm a consumer um, with a lived experience of mental distress, but I'm also a filmmaker. And I was asked to make a film about a group of clinicians and carers and consumers who formed a dual diagnosis advisory council and um, out, out at Eastern Health. And they formed this council over 10 years ago. And um, they've had some great successes and they've had their failures and they've had their ups and downs. And this film is really a celebration of all that, of kind of how they got it to work and, and some of the pitfalls and, and you'll get to meet some of the some of the faces and some of the personalities on both the, the, the clinician side and the consumer carer side. This is a really uplifting story I think about um, how people with lived experience whether they're carers or consumers can um, add a real dynamic voice to, into the dual diagnosis space or any clinical space for that matter. I hope you really enjoy the film and get a lot out of it. I got a lot out of just filming it and I learned a lot about dual diagnosis. Um, let's keep exploring ways to bring in the lived experience voice and I hope you enjoy this film. My name's Gavin Foster and I'm the manager of the dual diagnosis and service development out of Eastern Health within the mental health program there. Um, I've been involved with the dual diagnosis consumer care advisory council and the dual diagnosis working group since it began uh, over 10 years ago now. Um, and at the time, um, prior to it starting, I was working with a group of alcohol and drug and mental health staff members who were really quite interested in exploring how to get the best uh, uh, the best consumer representation of the consumer and care voice um, in working with clinicians and practitioners. Ten years ago, I was the manager of drug treatment at what was Knox Community Health, and we worked in partnership with Gavin Foster at Eastern Health and the team there, and it was a really exciting time of collaboration. So mental health services, AOD services working seamlessly together. And the vision was to create a service system that was seamless, that the person coming for help would really get their needs met no matter what they were, whether it was mental health or housing or drug treatment. Yes, I'm seeing somebody for my drug and alcohol, I'm seeing somebody for my mental health, and I'm going to my GP around my physical health. And I've got a chaotic life, trauma history, and I'm trying to juggle addiction and uh, severe mental illness. And you want me to turn up to three different appointments and three different service systems? Then people go to see they're not cooperating. They've dropped out of care. They're not willing. They're not motivated. It's not that they're just not capable right now. And I think we underestimate the chaos that operates within somebody who's struggling with addiction and mental health. A lot of uh, AOD workers were just, you know, counselling their clients and so forth. They, they had to deal with mental health issues, but they, a lot of them didn't have, you know, a lot of training. Um, and um, certainly at that point in time, you know, consumers, carers in the AOD sector didn't have a, I guess, a really big voice. So I actually went and had a meeting um, with the consumer consultant and a carer consultant out of the Eastern Health Mental Health Program, they actually said to me that it didn't really work just having one person representing a consumer and carer a voice, um, that often they could do a good job. But in fact, it worked better if there was a group of people who were actually able to represent the consumer and carer um, voice within uh, any kind of mental health and alcohol and drug conversation. I guess the vision that the dual diagnosis team had was to really ensure that the person coming for treatment was included in the planning. And so we, we started toying with the idea of an advisory group. An expert committed group of consumers and carers uh, who are accessible and engaged with a senior leadership group means that we're able to utilise those skills and expertise in a way that makes for a better clinical service. We became involved in a working group that 
was being, I suppose, auspiced by Eastern Health at the time. Um, and uh, Gavin Foster had been responsible for setting up that group. And I guess what was what was really, I suppose, remarkable and, and lovely about that group was that it, it involved a whole range of agencies. So the idea was that we would really work hard um, having had that advice about setting up a, a, a group or an advisory group, uh, that we would work pretty hard on actually getting a group of consumers and carers with lived experience of uh, dual diagnosis. I don't know. I mean, we, we were practising co-design, I think, before that became a real, a real buzzword. And being able to um, utilise that group uh, to help us with developing services, with uh, critically reviewing the services that we're providing and providing us with that level of expertise from within the program um, is, is really unique. And I think it's something that I haven't experienced before. The success of our 10 years of, uh, of the, the council activities on uh, three key principles, uh, learning together, uh, in this journey uh, uh, in the dual diagnosis space, uh, having a shared uh, expertise about how we go about doing things. We bring our personal experiences and knowledge and skills um, and we blend those together into our council activities. Since coming here, I've always known uh, and, and seen how the DDCAC are able to really contribute to the development of our service. My father passed away and that was the hardest thing. Yeah. In between that, you know, uh, my mother, she had alcohol, she, you know, she abused alcohol, abused pills, had a mental illness. Now, all through my life, uh, I was continuously going to funerals, funerals after funerals in my teens. Um, and then as I got into my twenties, it was happening again. I was going to funerals and funerals and funerals. And uh, every time I'd go to a funeral, it would, I'd say to myself, that's it, I'm quitting the piss. That's it, I'm, I'm going to be clean living. I'm going to do what I do. Yeah, however that would spiral out of control, I'd have moments of madness and just wander off. Bloody pack me bags and go, I wouldn't hang around. Yeah, learning to ground myself. On them days I couldn't, just didn't know how to ground myself. They call it Bluestone College because of the, the Bluestone walls here. I was never a smart ass in here, you know. It was um, I was like like a bit of a sheep. Now this looks very familiar, viewers. Follow me. This is where drugs and alcohol took me. The notorious A Division. Now, just follow me and I'll see if I can. Uh, this is 30 years ago, I so I've got to recollect a bit in the brain. Now, they're the cells up there, see the, the cell windows. That's the only access I had to natural light once the, the doors were shut, which was 4 30 at night or in the afternoon. start to treat my son as a friend and understand what he's going through. Um, just let things go and when, um, and I know when to step in and when to step back. And encourage their family to call the helpline to talk about what they're going through and their struggles. And if the family choose to seek help, 
they will change and they become different people. The way the consumer is struggling, the way it's exactly the same way the family struggled. Because when the person unwell relapse, it dragged down the whole family with them, especially the carers. July uh, 2015, I lost my son to suicide. Well, in the beginning, I felt I was very angry. I was very negative. You know, I had to do so much navigating. Everything was left to me to do as a carer. I was a forgotten that uh, individual in recovery. And um, I really had to um, fight to get anywhere or, or find any assistance. So I was very negative and everything I spoke was doom and gloom. The work between FAPME and the council has meant that more and more thinking about families is happening in the dual diagnosis space. So we're seeing parenting being considered and children being considered. And that's all part of the recovery for people who are coming into our services. What we know is that parenting is a really big motivator for change and for recovery. And so FATME working with the council um, means that we can develop resources that s staff and services can use. And we've also um, given people some ideas about having those conversations with parents about their kids and about what that might mean um, for their treatment. So I have a lived experience so, of being a consumer and also in mental health. So I've plotted my way along through life, not quite knowing how to deal with symptoms and problems and being able to find um, good doctors, good supports, mental health, medication, a number of different things that have actually built me to a spot where I can do this role. Everyone has their ups and downs as the way we manage our uh, problems and that we need to be kind to ourselves when we are going through struggles. It's not easy and sometimes we need supports and help in order to get where we want to go. I have a mentoring relationship with Leone who um, also is integral in the um, running of the group here at the Marinda CCU. Yeah, the community care unit. And we have a weekly meeting and it's open to consumers from mobile support team and the community care teams as well as the CCU consumers. And it's uh, for anyone that's got any dual diagnosis um, concerns and it's an open group. Um, so anybody's welcome to come. But over, I'd say, the last eight years, this is where the actual basis of the council um, became quite stronger. The, the team that came together have actually stayed together for quite a bit over that time. And they've been, it's been a supportive group and it's grown. There were certainly arguments. I remember two in particular that it nearly ended up in the car park and I was involved in them both, um, but it's, it, we just got on, got on with it. We, we did care for each other, but because we we're all uh, had, a, had a history and the carers in the group knew such behaviours because they either lived with them directly or, or were caring for someone in their, in their circle, uh, could understand. So it was a lot of, it was a lot of co good communication. We have a council meeting followed by a working group meeting uh, and uh, both meetings have the same agenda. Prior to those two meetings, uh, the council members themselves have a reflective practice session. 
uh, which just gives them an opportunity um, to meet together as a group um, to chat about uh, any issues of importance to them in their work in the council. We actually ask people to work with us because of their lived experience. One of the joys of actually doing this work is actually seeing people kind of go, go through this growth. But there are times when, as the, the lead, the leader for this activity, that I've had to really have a look at what's going on here, and particularly if a person started to relapse um, or, or to maybe go back towards substance use uh, for particular reasons, we've had to start making... Um, I guess, calls around how to support that person and how to make sure that just because that's happened, that doesn't mean the end of being, of working with us. It means that uh, maybe the clinicians in our group need to use their skills, their expertise to actually support that person to get through that. The 10 members of the Consumer and Care Advisory Council and the mental health professional team the dual diagnosis team, which is called the Mental Health Working Group, uh, have created uh, the council based on what we call the in tandem model. This is a bit like um, uh, riding a, uh, a tandem bicycle, that the council members come together with the working group uh, once a month to meet together um, to work through uh, an agenda of, of items and to plan activities going forward. The workload shifts according to the, the kinds of activities uh, that are being um, actioned at any particular time. Uh, Gavin Foster and the, the, the mental health working group uh, may take the lead uh, at times and definitely the council members will be taking a lead at, the, uh, at other times. I joined the Dual Diagnosis Consumer and Carer Council back in 2018, following um, alongside of my recovery, it played a, an extra beneficial aspect to my own recovery of dual diagnosis. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to start helping other people to on their journeys to recover. When I read the values and the code of conduct um, relating to the Dual Diagnosis Council, that really um, gave me a sense of security that they place the same values that I do. We realised there was a need for people in the clinical mental health program at Eastern Health to have uh, a way of connecting around their dual diagnosis and that uh, often the case managers weren't really connecting with people in the way that they needed them to. So they needed a, a more group-focused environment. Uh, so we started a group program in 2006, and it was run by staff at that time. And actually, as a dual diagnosis senior clinician, I basically ran the group and had staff come and help me. So that would educate them about dual diagnosis. We thought, wouldn't it be great if we could have people with a lived experience actually coming into the group program who understood dual diagnosis, who could relate, but were in a good point in their recovery journey to be able to put some input in. The IPU is the inpatient unit, the, the acute mental health and uh, addiction ward. So me and my co-worker, we go in there once a week and we facilitate a group and it's a peer support group. We've got a whiteboard and the, the clients in the hospital, they attend these groups, they, they sit down, there's probably up to 15 people. And we talk about, we initially start off with our stories, our stories about our addictions and our journeys in life. Then usually the clients that are sitting in, the, in this group, they talk about their addictions to drugs and to alcohol and gambling and other addictions. So then we've got we've got a common a common bond together. Then we come up with solutions on how to deal with our our addictions and our mental health. And one of the positives that uh, I see being part of the group program is the feedback we get from staff. You go back to the ward the following week staff member comes up and says, oh, 
so-and-so and such-and-such that was at the group last week has really interacted well with the clinical staff, the nurses, the counsellors, psychiatrists, psychologists. And that's, that's a really powerful thing. So Tony and I won't necessarily see that during the groups. Dual diagnosis is about telling the patients that there's a new system, a change system, an improved system, where there's no discrimination and stigma and condemnation. If you say to the staff, I've got a mental health problem and I've got a substance use concern, but I'm one person, can you treat both? And that's what we try to offer um, people when we see them in the various inpatient units. We offer a supportive and, um, yeah, safe place to share their story if they want to and to have that empathy and understanding for what people are going through and to offer, I don't like the word hope, but a way out. You know, part of their role, I think, has evolved into helping to educate staff just as much as it mm. is about supporting clients. So I think that's one of the bigger ones that sometimes we get called upon, you know, indirectly, that this is the feedback that's come yeah. about. Yeah. Um, the other thing is people that talk too much, take over a group, um, someone who's a bit manic, someone who's really unwell, um, people that sit quietly, people that are just upset in groups. I think that goes with the pre-planning for a group and then the mm. debriefing after a group is trying to, you know, support, you know, the group facilitators to advocate that they need these things at a minimum. So if they're running a group on at the CC, one of the CCUs or one of the inpatient units, that at a minimum there's one staff member there, um, you know, kind of per three or four clients that come. And if it gets more than that, then there's more staff. It turns out over the last few years since the group program has been running um, weekly uh, that um, um, we have two members of the council uh, attending the same group each week. And uh, just for convenience and, and uh, um, good planning purposes, um, it turns out that uh, most groups have the same uh, two consumer and carer members um, attending each week. What has been driving me in this space are two things. One is I know that we need to do this whole dual diagnosis thing so much better than we are. So we need to work in the co-occurring mental health and alcohol and drug space much better. The other part for me is around the impact of the consumer and carer voice in the delivery of our services. And this is in some ways, whilst we've had it going for maybe 10, 15 years now, maybe even longer in some areas, we haven't really ex explored the full, uh, the full complement of activities and ideas that we can have with the lived experience workforce. Thinking about what it was like 10 years ago, I guess it's really interesting how hard it's been to get a consumer advisory council happening, really, because when you think about it, you know, it, it's kind of like democracy. You know, we we people have rights. People have rights to participate in in their healthcare, and this is healthcare. This is you know a health issue. But because it was drug use, um, or because it was mental health, it was such a stigmatised issue. And I think there was a lot of fear in service providers that if we have an advisory council with consumers you know, they're going to take over or they're going to ask for things that we can't deliver. But there's a committed group of people out in the eastern area that seem to have really stayed in there even after they've gone well into the recovery. I think they've They've enjoyed the process and I think there's a culture and a dynamic in that uh, group that is kind of really welcoming and inclusive and I think that's been the strength of it. Bell Groves, who was our most recent representative, talked about the being able to sit in and listen to and hear all the other stuff that's going on 
at a service and a systems level really helps them shape their thinking and the emphasis of where they put their work. Where I am standing now and what I am doing, it's because of my son. I've learned from his journey and my journey with him. My journey to speak up and to always fight and um, advocate on behalf of the carers and the consumers and trying to spread awareness so other families and carers don't stand where I am standing. This film hasn't tried to tell the whole story, but it is an indication of what empowered consumers, carers, clinicians, and practitioners can achieve when they work together. So we hope that during this insight of our partnerships throughout Eastern et Metropolitan Melbourne, that you've gained a real sense of the way care is provided to someone living with mental health issues coupled with drug and alcohol behaviours. If you'd like to know more, come and see us, because our in tandem model need not just be celebrated by us, it's to be shared with you. And thank you for your time and hopefully enthusiasm. Well, we thank you for your time today. See you around.